Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Abby Bronson, and I am the SVP of Research Strategy at PPMD, and I want to welcome you all. Um, we are so honored to have Synthera's CEO and CMO, Chief Executive Officer and Chief Medical Officer on the phone this afternoon to give us an update on the respiratory health in Duchenne and the ongoing Citeros clinical trial. They've really been doing some wonderful work for our Duchenne community, and I want to thank them for taking the time to speak with us today. So as usual with these webinars, um, before we get going, I want to just let you know a couple things. Um, we will have time for questions at the end of the talk, so if you have a question or need more clarity on something, submit your question in the chat box. We'll try to take it right then and there, or we might wait till the end, but we will get to as many as we can. Um, and any that we don't answer, we'll get to by email after the webinar. Um, the webinar is being recorded, so um, you'll be able to access this at a later date. Um, and that will be posted on our PPMD website, website in a couple of days. So now it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers for today. Speaking first will be Thomas Meyer, PhD, who was appointed CEO of Santhera in October of 2011. Before that, he was the Chief Scientific Officer for Santhera for seven years. Um, he was the founder and CEO of Myocontract, which was a Basel-based research company focused on orphan neuromuscular diseases, which emerged with Graffinity Pharmaceuticals of Heidelberg, Germany, in 2004 to form today's Synthera. So I thought that was an interesting little history of how Synthera came to be. Um, he received his PhD in biology from the University of Basel in Switzerland and worked in academia after that, and he's won numerous awards for scientific research in neuromuscular diseases from the NIH and others. And then secondly, we have Dr. Christina Nigren, who joined Synthera Oh, um, who Jan, sorry about that, who joined Santhera as CMO and um, head of development, and she's also a member of Santhera's executive management team in January. She joined in January 2017. Christina studied chemistry and biochemistry and graduated as a medical doctor from the Karolinska Institute of Sweden. She brings over 18 years of experience as a biopharmaceutical executive in drug development across multiple therapeutic areas, including orphan diseases. She's worked in clinical development for lots of big pharma, Wyeth, AstraZeneca, and Binovitrum, and most recently as VP and head of clinical development at Sobe. So with that, those illustrious bios, I'm going to turn it over to Stan Sarah. Thank you very much, Abby, and um, welcome everybody to this webinar. This is Thomas Mai. I'm pleased to be with you now today together with Christina. Yes, good afternoon, and thank you very much for the invitation. This is Christina Nygren, I'm Head of Development, as you heard. So what, what we would like to do today, as you see in the first slide, give an update on our development program with Puldiza Idebinon in patients with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and we will focus mainly on respiratory function aspects uh, and our approach to that. Um, I skip the disclaimer slide and uh, walk you through the agenda. In this uh, slide, you also see our picture. So uh, I will be covering the first three bullets on the agenda, is giving an overview about the understanding of respiratory function in patients with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, also aspects of respiratory care for patients, and then we are, I will start off with the introduction of our program with Idebenon, trade name will be Puldiza, uh, the development program that has been ongoing for quite some time. And then I will be handing over to Christina, who will specifically talk about the ongoing uh, clinical trial we call the CDEROS trial, currently also enrolling patients in the United States. Um, and then she will also talk about some community resources that we were pleased to develop together with PPMD uh, that are available for patients and families for education and information. Before I go on to the next slide, I should mention quite, quite clearly that Puldiza idebenone is currently not approved for the treatment of Duchenne muscular dystrophy, so it's an investigational drug, but we will give you an update on our regulatory path towards the end of the presentation. So if we go to the first uh, matter, uh, that is understanding of the respiratory function in patients with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And I would like to highlight quite clearly the medical need that is, we still have for effective treatment of respiratory illnesses, particularly in non-ambulant ambulant patients with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. If you see this uh, little chart and graph to the right, 
uh, it is well described, and you know that that there's uh, the initial disease cause affects lower and upper limb strength and function, but it ultimately, at some point in time, patients become non-ambulant, and then uh, the loss of respiratory function is the preeminent uh, clinical complications that we need to take care of, uh, alongside also cardiac problems that patients may develop. So we are focusing really now in our discussion about the, uh, the time during which patients lose respiratory function that is measured as a decreased in lung volume and airflow from the lungs and to the lungs. Also the decreased uh, ability to cough effectively and clear the airways from mucus. And if you accumulate mucus because you can't cough properly, then this increases the risk of airway infections and pneumonia. So this is the medical complication that we, we observe and is observed in the clinic in patients of older age. And as you know, there's currently no approved pharmacological treatment specifically designed for the treat, treatment of respiratory dysfunction or respiratory function decline. So clearly today we have a medical need in patients, older patients, non-ambulant patients, that experiences loss of respiratory function and associated complications. Now, in the next slide, I will uh, introduce you to two technical terms, and, and they are shown here. And these are actually measurements of respiratory function that we and others are using routinely in monitoring this, this uh, aspect of disease. Uh, and so the chart that I'm showing you here is uh, over age, so from 6 to 30 years roughly. You see uh, two values for pulmonary function or respiratory functions. One is in blue. That's FVC, this is forced vital capacity in percent of predicted, that's how it is measured or, or, or plotted. And this is essentially the lung volume. So the larger lung volume, the better it is. Uh, and you see the second parameter in green, which is PEF, peak expiratory flow. That's the maximum speed with which an uh, individual can exhale air from the, from the lungs. Both of these parameters are normalized to healthy individuals or to the standard uh, parameters, so they are expressed as percent of predicted. Around 100% would be totally normal. Anything that is below 80% is uh, below the lower limit of normal, and that is becoming abnormal, so to speak. So uh, as you can see in this chart, and these are data I should refer to from the Synergy group uh, reported in published literature already, uh, you see that patients roughly around 10 years of age fall below the 80% uh, threshold, which, as I said, is the definition of abnormal respiratory function. And then both of these parameters, FVC percent predicted and PEF percent predicted, follow a almost linear decline uh, in the 10 years to come, uh, roughly uh, beyond the age of 20, 22 years, uh, upon which then both parameters sort of flatten out and, and reach a floor. So clearly uh, the respiratory function uh, follows a linear, almost linear decline that can be monitored by multiple parameters and shown here are two, forced vital capacity, FVC, and peak expiratory flow, PEF. So that, that is what is very well described in the literature. Several natural history studies have independently confirmed that type of uh, decline pattern. And um, coming back to what I actually mean for the patient, and, uh, and this is shown in this slide here, uh, we like to describe the loss of respiratory function as a vicious cycle, so to speak. So if you start to the uh, red box on number one to the right top corner, as I, as I told you, patients uh, begin to decline in respiratory function roughly about the time when they become non-ambulant. So this, is, this coincides, so patients becoming non-ambulant typically start really to decline in respiratory function. As I said, they can be measured as a reduction in forced vital capacity, FVC, the lung volume, and peak expiratory flow, PEF, the speed with which you can exchange air uh, from the lungs. Now, if you decline in this uh, lung function or respiratory function measures, that uh, decreases the ability to cough efficiently. So if you need to cough and you don't have the force in the muscles that control the lung function, then you cannot really uh, cough properly. 
And this uh, reduces then the clearance of the airways. So you have, and patients do experience that, uh, the risk of uh, clogging of airways, which again can be measured as a reduced flow of air from the lungs and into the lungs, like PEF, and also a reduced peak cough flow. The speed with which you can cough, the, the strength of the cough is reduced. And as a consequence of that, uh, there's a risk that you accumulate mucus in, in parts of the lungs, which then increases the risk of infections. And these infections can be what we call bronchopulmonary adverse events, so that they're really uh, effect, uh, infections that causes then patients to, uh, for need of even hospitalization in severe cases. It also commands the uh, need for using systemic antibiotics, and as I said, the rate of hospitalizations is frequently increased in, in patients who experience advanced levels of pulmonary function or respiratory function decline. And this goes on, so the, the, the more of these infections you have and the weaker uh, the muscles become, obviously then the cycle goes on. And uh, over time, really, as I showed before, in a linear way, you, you patients lose the capability to uh, um, perform respiratory function to a normal level. And this uh, reduced uh, performance of respiratory function clearly comes with clinical risks. So if you want to quantify that, so what actually is the risk uh, associated with decline in respiratory function? Uh, that is highlighted in the next slide. And again, we are talking about the same two parameters as I introduced you before. So this is shown here now on the left, the PEF, was a peak expiratory flow and to the right fourth vital capacity data. And they, again, are from the Synergy Group, uh, and we collaborate with the Synergy Group since many years now. And what these graphs show you is actually the rate of hospitalizations in patients per year measured over the groups of, or, or yeah, bins, I should say, groups of uh, PEF to the left and fourth vital capacity brackets. So, you read this in the following way. If you take the left chart, PEF, so this is the more lighter blue, uh, you have fairly fairly normal, but already some abnormality uh, pulmonary function. This would be the left bar. You would have a uh, rate of hospitalization of less than 0.01 hospitalizations per year. But the more you lose the respiratory function, the smaller PEF gets, down to less than 30%, which is the largest bar, then you see that your uh, risk of hospitalizations due to respiratory events is increasing dramatically. And the same is, is uh, true for forced vital capacity. The, the smaller, the, the lower the forced vital capacity, the lung volume is, which is the increasing bars, the higher is the rate and the risk of hospitalizations. And that is very well established, and I thank uh, people like Hank Meyer and, and Craig McDonald and group and, and many others who have contributed to our understanding of a correlation between loss of respiratory function and clinical outcomes, which is risk of hospitalization even uh, caused by uh, these complications. So let's, let's talk about now what we actually can do about these problems. And uh, I will spend a minute or so to just mention there are resources available to the community to educate families and patients about uh, care that can be given to patients experiencing respiratory function loss. And I would like to thank Anthony, for whom we have taken a picture here, and we can, uh, we can show this here. He is one of these patients who already... Uh, is dependent on assisted uh, ventilation devices, um, and we will we talk about this for a minute. Uh, there are, uh, I should say, before I go into this next slide here, I should say there are uh, a lot of information available on the PPMD website and other sources that educate in much more detail what type of devices and equipment is available. That is not the purpose of our talk today to go into that detail, but I would like to highlight that there are care guidelines that are published, such as the Bernkrant uh, series of papers and others, who clearly give advice to families um, how to monitor uh, respiratory function and how actually treating physicians should take care of the patient and monitor that. So uh, there should be clearly respiratory function tests done at least once a year at the time when patients are still walking, Recommendations are that uh, as soon as patients become non-ambulant and depending on the wheelchair, then they should definitely have a test twice a year. 
uh, vaccinations are recommended. Uh, again, please refer to specific guidelines. And uh, at certain age groups, pe patients and boys should then using um, some core respiratory therapies that include the use of cofferces devices and other devices, which I'm not going into any detail here. But clearly also when uh, some disease occurs which is related to pulmonary function, um, there will be an increased need for the use of such devices and also other interventions to take care of patients that are exposed, for instance, to airway infections. Um, I should say that um, just like blood pressure, you don't feel if your respiratory function is not too well uh, until it is already um, causing problems. So uh, I think I would advocate that families and, and patients should really seek advice from treating physicians when and how often they should be tested for pulmonary function because this helps you to um, avoid problems going forward or being prepared for these uh, pulmonary function problems. So Thomas, uh, the message. I, yeah. Can I ask a quick question? Because when you're saying, I mean, I'm just curious. So when you show those numbers on slide eight about the risk of hospitalization, were those uh, outcome measures the FCC and PF? Was that with boys on respiratory therapies or none of them? I mean, do you see what I'm asking? Like using respiratory therapies, like you're saying on the fourth bullet on this current slide. Um, if boys are yes. getting the proper standard care, would, the, would those risk of hospitalization numbers go down? Uh, well, uh, Yain, I would say, I mean, there's always a risk. Um, obviously, using the appropriate devices is, is improving the function and may reduce the risk. But as you know, and also from the natural history studies, we know that even uh, when these devices are used, the risk of, of uh, mucus accumulation and infections is imminent, and in right. general, uh, the reports that we have available from the Synergy uh, data source uh, indicate that there's an increased risk. Now, whether the exact number is, is with or without devices needs to be discussed and analyzed further, uh, but I just wanted to say that there's a clear correlation, irrespective of whether you new, use these devices or not, there's a higher probability of risk of hospitalization due to respiratory complications in patients who have advanced uh, involvement of respiratory function decline. Okay, thank you. So uh, coming back to the, to the current slide, I, I would like to use the same type of graph now in two consecutive slides just to illustrate a little bit what physicians will do when they advise you on, on and inform you about the respiratory function status. Again, I show you this little chart that we have taken from the previous slide. Uh, and there are certain thresholds that are recognized by uh, experts as being informative about the pulmonary function status of a, of a patient. Uh, for instance, um, if you fall below 80%, as I said, uh, that is a threshold uh, which is known to be uh, the border of abnormal respiratory function uh, with increasing loss, so with lower and lower numbers, uh, there's clearly the 50% threshold which is, which is recognized as a, a threshold where patients frequently experience nighttime hypoventilation, that is not, exough, not enough oxygen exchange or air exchange with the, with the lungs, and then with a decreased uh, pulmonary respiratory function, this is becoming more severe and more, um, uh, let's say, need is, is uh, presenting itself to assist patients in respira respiration. And the way that is done is actually shown in the next slide. It's a similar image you just saw that the, the, um, the text changed. Uh, and this is the increased need to use these devices, such as corpuses devices and similar devices. Uh, with a 50% threshold crossing, there's um, in indication that the nighttime ventilation support might be, might be needed. Uh, further decline would indicate the use of mouthpiece or nasal ventilation, and then further decline around 30% is really a threshold where continuous ventilation is, is uh, in most cases, recommended. That is just giving you an overview of what are sort of thresholds that have experts have defined now that uh, physicians will look at when they test your respiratory function and make recommendations to avoid further loss and, and uh, ameliorate the loss of uh, respiratory function and support the respiratory function by these devices. 
Again, it is not the purpose to talk about which device to use when. That is not my field of expertise, but I wanted to just wrap it up and say the guidelines that have been published and are well uh, practiced, uh, they are also linked to certain recommendations to support patients when they experience uh, respiratory function decline. So with this, uh, this was of the introduction to the subject matter. I would like to now summarize the status of our clinical development program with idebenone, and we will use the trade name Poldisa now going forward both in Europe and the United States, so I'll just introduce you to that name. Uh, the overview of our uh, program is uh, shown in this slide, and actually, as you will see, we are in this business for quite some time, and I have to say I'm very glad that since the uh, very beginning we were working very collaboratively with uh, PPMD and other organizations that support patients. So we had completed already uh, in the year 2006 and 2007, we have completed a phase two study, which we call the DELTHI study, and then subsequently an open label study, study which we call the DELTHI extension study. And this was more exploratory. We, we investigated several outcome measures like uh, pulmonary function and also cardiac function. Then uh, we, we got advice both from European regulators and from the FDA, and we embarked on a phase three program, which we uh, call the DELOS uh, program. Uh, this DELOS program took us quite some time, as you can see from the years that are indicated in these uh, blue boxes above. Uh, it was a 64-patient study that was run mostly in Europe with one or two U.S. centers involved only at that time. And, and this study actually uh, uh, enrolled only patients that did not use concomitant glucocorticoids at the time. And the reason was we did not understand, and also the FDA did not understand, what was the impact of steroids uh, on respiratory function outcomes. And so the advice was that we should investigate uh, patients on steroids separately from those off steroids. And so the initial study was, was done, the DELOS study was done in patients not using glucocorticoids, and that's the abbreviation I will use now going forward is GC, stands for glucocorticoids or steroids. And as you know, there are two main steroids used currently, this prednisone and uh, deflacicort. And then we have, and I will also show you some data of a long-term um, data collection we call the SUROS study. It was uh, a data collection of patients that were uh, leaving the DELO study but actually were uh, treated for up to four or five years uh, in an expanded access program that was possible in certain countries in, in Europe under certain conditions. And then ongoing, and this will be the subject that Christina will then touch on, is the CIDROS study, which is a, a phase three study and currently the largest study ongoing in Duchenne muscular dystrophy running in 60 centers, as I will show you, both in the U.S. and Europe and Israel. And that is now in the final phase of enrollment. And it's also a call that we will repeat then later on again for patients to come forward because we would like to wrap up the study enrollment now by uh, whatever, fourth quarter this year, but so imminently we are in the latest, last phase of enrollment, and patients who are eligible and complete the CIDROS trial will be then uh, allowed to go into an open-label CIDROS extension study, and this study, CIDROS and CIDROS extensions, are in patients on steroids. But I spare that for, for Christina to elaborate a bit more, so this is just the overview, just to say that we are now running clinical trials with Adebinon since 2006 um, in, in patients with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Now, a word to how Adebinon actually works, and I, uh, don't be afraid, it's a, maybe a complicated busy slide, there's another one coming, but I'd like to summarize it very um, briefly in a, in a following way. I mean, you all know that uh, the cause of Duchenne muscular dystrophy is the lack of the protein called dystrophin. And there are efforts undergoing, ongoing that uh, try to replace the missing dystrophin and restore the function. But uh, what is actually damaging the muscle cells is, are the downstream consequences of lack of dystrophin. Uh, if, if muscles is contracting, as you know, and dystrophin is lacking, that damages the muscle cell surface. And as a consequence, there's a an uncontrolled influx of calcium into the muscle cells. Now, muscle cells can cope with calcium quite well. However, if this influx of calcium is increasingly uh, occurring, uh, regularly occurring, 
then this has two uh, downstream effects, both damaging uh, the function and, and the structure of the muscle cells even further. One is shown to the right, and that is that the calcium overload leads to a down-regulation or impairment of mitochondrial function and the reduction in energy production. And that is shown to the very right. Uh, maybe I can use this pointer here. Hold on a second. So here we so so we are in this part here. So we have a decreased mitochondrial uh, energy production, which ultimately is seen as a reduced level of ATP. This is the uh, agent that is used in the cell to, to uh, represent cellular energy. And as a consequence, that contributes to muscle cell death. The second pathway, there's also a consequence of this calcium overload shown here on top, is oxidative stress. And this is linked together, so the, the mitochondrial function goes down. As a consequence, oxidative stress goes up. And this increased oxidative stress again contributes to muscle cell damage. And, and muscle cell loss. Now, this, this is um, sort of the, the pathology of, of Duchenne muscular dystrophy on the cellular level. Now, what does idebenone do? I'm coming back and show you that again. So we have the same pathways again, but now idebenone has two functions. It is, first of all, a, a, a catalytic uh, mechanism that it is involved that helps idebenone to go from the cytosol, from the aqueous uh, part from the water-soluble part of the cell into the mitochondria where it actually can facilitate electron flux, so the handover of electrons, which ultimately is increasing the production of cellular energy like ATP as shown here in the blue, blue arrow goes up. So that is one very well described biochemical uh, pathway that adebanone can facilitate. The second one is equally important. It's actually by the same mechanism it is reducing the uh, level of reactive oxygen species, this is the oxidative stress I've mentioned before, detoxifies these molecules and reduces the oxidative stress, which together with the increased uh, production of cellular energy helps muscle cells to stay alive. Now, idebenone is um, doing that by being shuttled back and forth from the uh, cell environment to the mitochondria is a catalytic process, as I said, so idebenone in the cell can be cycled and recycled, and that depends on an enzyme which we have and others have described in the past, so we understand very, very precisely the uh, biochemical pathway that leads to these desirable effects of increased energy production and reduction in oxidative stress. So um, this is sort of very high level, but it shows you that we understand quite well where in the pathological cascade of dystrophin deficiency idebenone exerts its pharmacological action. Now, uh, one word about the data from a previously uh, completed and published uh, phase three trial, which is called the DELOS trial. Uh, this is, uh, until today, the first uh, uh, only uh, uh, placebo-controlled uh, trial that has really met its primary endpoint on a functional parameter, um, and it has extensively been published. I only would like to summarize very briefly that we were able to demonstrate in this trial that uh, patients treated with idebenone, shown to the right uh, as the orange lines with all the measurements that we have uh, taken, let me just activate this arrow here. So this line, over a one-year period, there was a small reduction, but an overall relatively stable respiratory function. Now, in this particular chart, measured as peak expiratory flow. Again, this is, the, as I mentioned before, the speed with which you can exchange air uh, from the lungs. And in contrast to that, and in line with the expected natural history of the uh, population, is actually the decline in the placebo group and the difference was statistically significant. We have seen similar effects on uh, global lung functions like forced vital capacity and inspiratory flow of air. So many of these parameters were studied and they've all been published in the meantime. They all show the same consistent picture that in the DELOS trial there was a, a therapeutic effect of idebenone in preserving respiratory function. Now, you may ask, uh, what, is, what does it mean for the patient? Uh, that is shown in the last bullet. We also could demonstrate uh, um, that in the same study, uh, patients on idebenone had a reduced risk 
of bronchopulmonary adverse events, such as airway infections. Uh, they had a reduced need for systemic antibiotic treatment that is typically used to treat airway infections. And there was a reduced risk of hospitalization due to respiratory complications. And that's actually um, shown on the right chart here. So clearly, uh, measures of respiratory function were beneficial, uh, been influenced positively by, by idebinone, and this also translated into aspects of patient uh, advantage, such as reduced risks of uh, bronchopulmonary adverse events or even hospitalizations. Now, these were data from a 12-month study. As I said, they have been published now in, in number of publications by uh, a series of investigators. But what we didn't have until very recently were long-term data. So we could not inform whether a treatment over many years would actually be, continue to be beneficial for patients. And this is something that we have collected now very recently. Um, let me just click this off. Um, and this is what we call um, the uh, SUROS study. There was a um, real-world approach where we have um, collected prospectively data from patients that were, after the completion of the DELO study, continued to be treatment, treated with idebinone. Some of the patients had some interruptions in the treatment, on average up to 1.2 years, but many patients were treated on average up to four years with idebinone. And uh, this was possible, this data collection, because in certain European countries, uh, we could provide, after the completion of the DELO study, uh, patients free of charge with idebinone upon request from treating physicians and families. And so we have now recently collected, uh, prospectively planned, the collection of data from this, um, from this treatment period, and we have analyzed those, and they will be uh, summarized in the next two slides. And, and it's important to know because we have now really long-term data where patients have been treated up to six years with idebinone, and they, uh, these data inform us that the treatment continued for several years has a continued positive effect on the respiratory function. And I'll show you that in, in the next two slides. So this is an analysis shown here uh, looking at the primary outcome of this particular study. Uh, this is a change, the annual change in forced viable capacity. Again, this is lung volume, the, the better the... Uh, so the more you have, the better it is. But it is also known that patients do lose this forced vital capacity, um, and on average, this is a 6-7% um, or so in natural history. What is shown here are 11 patients for whom we have periods of time where they were not treated with idebinone, and this is the uh, gray bar. And we have, from the same patients, periods of time where they were treated with idebinone. This is the orange bar. And if we now calculate the annual change in forced vital capacity percent predicted, you will see that uh, patients who were not treated lost about 7 percent points per year, roughly, on, on forced vital capacity if they're not treated. But this was reduced by about 50 percent when they were switched on to treatment. So clearly showing that uh, changing from off treatment to on treatment reduced the annual rate of decline in this particular case, forced vital capacity, but we have also looked at other parameters. But what is actually perhaps more important is the next slide, and this is a, a comparison where we looked at the longer term and, and asked, so is it really true that year on year the rate of decline is reduced? And you see here again the orange bars are, are patients treated with Idebinone and the black bars I like to focus here is actually matching patients from the natural history study uh, collected by the Synergy Group. And you see in year one to two, <clears throat> if you compare the orange bar with the black bar, the orange bar is shorter, i.e. the loss of respiratory function is, is smaller. And this is maintained year after year up to six years. So still in the last year, year five and six, we have an average decline of 7% as expected uh, in the um, um, forced vital capacity of the natural history data, but this is reduced by approximately 50% here uh, in the patient group that were treated with idebinone. Now, this analysis has, has certain limitations. The uh, subject number is very small, so it's, it's, uh, it's only, as you see, 18 in the very beginning and 9 in the very end. But nevertheless, the analysis that we have conducted so far are supportive 
of what we have seen in the previously completed and successful uh, randomized placebo-controlled DELOS trial. And um, just to sum it up and, and add one more aspect to it, I told you that also in the uh, randomized placebo-controlled trial we saw clear um, uh, reduction in the risk of bronchopulmonary adverse events, and we see a sim similar pattern in the su Suro study. Again, treated patients or in periods where they were treated, the risk of bronchopulmonary adverse events such as airway infections was clearly uh, reduced compared to the uh, sharp increase in such uh, events observed in patients not treated with idebinon. So, um, so this actually um, concludes the overview of the data that we have currently in-house. And um, I'm now handing over to Christina, who will introduce you to the ongoing CEDARO study, where we look at the efficacy and safety of idebinon in patients on glucocorticoid treatment. Christina, hand over. Thank you very much, Thomas. Yes, so I will present the CEDARO study. Um, I guess probably some of you have heard about the study because it has been ongoing for for some years, but it's the study where we're looking at idebinon effects in patients that are using glucocorticoids. So if we, yes. So as, as Thomas mentioned before, we have previously studied the effects of idebinon in patients that are not using glucocorticoids. That was the DELO study. So now based on data from natural history, we have learned that glucocorticoids can delay the start of the respiratory function decline but once the decline starts, the rate of the decline is similar as in patients not using glucocorticoids. And if we look at the graph, you see in the white bubbles that are the naive or those that, that have maybe previously used glucocorticoids. So patients not using glucocorticoids, they start to decline maybe around 10 years of age. But if you look at the black bubbles in the graph here, that's the glucocorticoid users and they start to decline a little bit later, uh, two years. But once the decline has started, this, this will continue in the same rate. So, so with this knowledge in mind, we could design the CIDRO studies um, for patients that are using glucocorticoids and also be confident that there is also a similar uh, unmet need here. So the CIDRO study is the largest ongoing study in DMD. Uh, it, as I mentioned, it has been ongoing for, for quite some years, and we really hope that we can uh, finalize the enrollment during this year. So we will continue for um, another uh, few months, a little bit difficult to know exactly, um, but we, we really, really hope that we can finalize the study now. We are really eager to see um, the results of the study. And in addition, I would like to say that all patients in the CIDRO study uh, will be offered to continue in the open label extension study. So, um, <clears throat> yes. So in, in the um, uh, study, we are also um, enrolling both ambulant and non-ambulant patients, and patients of all mutation types will be eligible. And as you can see, we have a website that is called the CIDROSDMD.com where there's more information to be found uh, about the CIDROS study. So if we go to the uh, study overview slide, so here you can see the graph, uh, the overview of the study design. The aim is to enroll 266 uh, DMD patients on glucocorticoids. I mentioned it is the largest uh, DMD study. Uh, patients will be randomized, either idebinone or placebo and the duration of the treatment is 18 months. And after this, all patients will then uh, be offered to join the uh, open label extension and, and everyone will receive uh, um, idebinone treatment. The primary endpoint is the change in FVC, forced vital capacity, uh, from baseline to week 78. And of course, we are looking at a number of secondary endpoints. These are mainly re related to respiratory function um, and, and of course, um, regarding relating to the question before, we're also collecting data on uh, uh, cough assist and uh, assisted ventilation, hospitalizations, side effects, uh, tolerability, and, and so on. So we can look at the next slide, the, the key inclusion criteria. So to be eligible for the CIDRO study, patients need to be 10 years or older, so there's no upper age limit. All DMD mutation types are allowed, 
um, respiratory function measure, that's FVC, need to be in the decline phase, so below 80%, but it has to be above 35%. So we are looking for patients that are in the uh, respiratory decline phase. Um, FVC also needs to be reliably measured between screening and baseline, so that's one of the key inclusion uh, criteria. Also, uh, glucocorticoids should have been used for at least 12 months preceding the study. And, of course, relevant vaccinations are needed to be able to be enrolled into the study. So, if we look at the next uh, slide, yes, there's the uh, graph over uh, all the sites that we have in, in the study. We have more than 60 centers, maybe up to 63, 64 or so, that are participating in the SIDRO study. It's centers in the U.S., in Europe, and in Israel. And, and you can see in red here uh, all the current sites that we have across the U.S., most of the countries um, in, in Europe as well. So, so this is a really big project. Many people are involved, uh, various expertise. Uh, I think it's fantastic because really cross-functional uh, collaboration here. And I really, really would like to thank everyone that is involved. I know it's really hard work. So thanking all of the sites, all the people uh, involved in the study, and, of course, all, all the boys and the patients. And you will also mention this later, Thomas, but I just want to point out this, this is a really big project. So we can then um, talk about the regulatory strategy. What are our plans? Why are we doing uh, the CIDRO study? Well, after full enrollment in the CIDRO study, we um, plan to have top-line data available by first half of 2021. So when we have this data, then we can submit to the FDA so, of course, we hope for positive data in this study. Uh, and based on this data and the DELO study that we presented before, we can then apply for full approval for boys with respiratory function de decline uh, that are using and that are not using uh, GCs. So that's the plan for U.S. So the CIDRO study is really, really important that we can finalize it because we need to uh, submit the data to FDA. So, so that's why we're doing the study. And if we take a look at the Europe, there's a little bit difference in plans. Here we are um, using the DELO study as the basis for the submission. Um, the submission is planned for the second quarter 2019, which is soon. <laughs> it's very soon. So, and in addition, um, in the EU submission, in addition to the Phase 3 DELO study, we will also present more natural history data that, that has been analyzed, and these data will support the clinical importance of the effect that we have seen. Also, we are adding uh, the long-term zero study, and this will then provide additional open-label, real-world, uh, long-term evidence. And we plan to seek a conditional marketing authorization for boys that are not using GCs in Europe. And when we have the Sideros data, we can then expand the label uh, to also GC users. So that's why Sideros will be important both for U.S. but also for, for Europe. So that was all about the study and the regulatory plans, and I'm happy to uh, answer questions, but maybe we could just take a look at what, what resources there are about respiratory function, because there has been um, a big effort to make available for the community uh, some resources on respiratory function. So there are dedicated uh, websites that can be found for the U.S. It's takeabreathdmd.com, and in Europe, uh, the website is called breathedushen.com. In here, you can find information about uh, respiratory health and its stages, uh, how is respiratory function measured. Uh, it describes complications and symptoms of respiratory function decline. Also, there's information on ventilation, uh, options on devices, and some discussions on the emergency care. So I hope you will find these resources useful. And then... Uh, in collaboration with PPMD, 
um, video resources have been developed and they are made available through the PPMD website. And I can only recommend you to look at these video resources. I think they are great re resources and give um, really good, well-explained uh, information. So with that, I'd like yeah, to I hand over to Thomas. Thank you very much, Christine. I take back and summarize our presentation. So um, I wanted to, well, we wanted to summarize in a way that we hope that we have informed you that treating uh, respiratory function decline is an urgent medical need in patients with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. We showed you some data that we have collected in the past years with idebinon that uh, we believe has the potential to slow the decline in respiratory function in a meaningful manner. We have informed you about the ongoing CSIRDOS trial that is still enrolling and we expect to uh, complete this uh, enrollment this fall. And so we are asking for the last wave of patients to come forward. And we also would like to take the opportunity to thank uh, the collaboration we had over the past years with PPMD. Uh, together we were helping uh, developing uh, educational material and resources that we have now, with the help of PPMD, disseminated. And I hope that you find these helpful and families find these helpful to uh, get information about the management of respiratory function weakness and how to, to, to address this. And before we go to Q&A, question and answers, I would like to finalize with the last slide and in behalf of the Santero team, thank all of the uh, patients and families and treating physicians and experts that are working with us. I know that you dedicate a lot of time and effort to advance this research, not just for us as Santero, but for all the companies in the field. And we enjoy the collaboration uh, also with other companies and I think we all into that uh, together. And so my last slide here really is to thank you, the families and the patients and caregivers and PPMD and other organizations who are working with us. And, and with this, uh, we will need to conclude our presentation, hand over back to Abby to open up the question and answer session. Great, Thomas and Christina. Thank you so much. That was a lot of information, but really good information. Um, so a couple questions that have come in. Um, first of all, during the trial, you talked about in the inclusion criteria, the FEC having to be below 80% but above 35. What happens, percent predicted, what happens if a patient falls below that 35% predicted during the trial? Do they get to continue? Does their data not yes. count? Like what, what happens? Yes, absolutely. This is the inclusion. So this is as inclusion. So, so that's right. only yeah to be able to be enrolled into the study. And then, of course, so we understand that patients will fall. Uh, it, it might happen that they will fall below. But this is this is just we have chosen to have these these um, values to be between 35 and 80 because then uh, we will be able to measure uh, effect. We have a decline. So, okay. Um, and for the steroid use that you have um, uh, listed for the Citeros trial, can it be any steroid? Can it, you know, there's multiple dosing regimens. Does is there any yes. consideration to that? What's one of the details? I think it's, it's just that it has to be that they have had it for 12 months and that it's on on stable treatment. So. You know, if they have not so changed their matter. regime, they are eligible. So it, yes. we, we recognize that multiple regimes currently used, and we allow any of those. Yes, yes. Okay, so prednisone, defazacar, doesn't, and plaza doesn't matter. Mm. No. Um, and in ter are, there, are there drugs that are exclusive? Like if you're, obviously you can't get into another trial, but if you're, um, you know, even something like CoQ10, are there other exclusion criteria that would make you not, in terms of, other drug regimens? There are certain, uh, let's say, restrictions to certain uh, medications, but this is maybe it's for, for that call maybe too detailed. Um, so, they, for instance, if you have, uh, um, let me just look at the... It's a the asthma medication. Asthma medications is, is, cannot be used because that actually may have an impact on respiratory function. And there are other medications that need to be discussed uh, in detail with the, with, the, with the investigator, I think would be too too long to go through that list. It needs also some medical interpretation. Mm. But um, uh, I think there are no other unusual exclusion uh, criteria that are here. So I, I guess this is something I would rather recommend that 
an interested uh, family would discuss with a study site, uh, maybe over the phone initially and then get more information. And, yes. and maybe we should mention also that, that this has been um, a discussion within the study and there has been some adjustments uh, to what medications are allowed when we understood there was also difference in what medications are being used in US and Europe. Mm -hmm. so, okay. so this is slightly updated. So if, if someone has been in contact very early on, with the center, maybe it could be useful to be in contact with the physicians again and to look at the current protocol. So. Okay. Um, and there's some, um, there was a question that came in, and it was about um, Raxone and getting, wondering if there's a way to get access to it while this trial is still going on. So that would be probably expanded access or compassion use. The, per, the, the question relates to the fact that idebinone itself seems to be hard to get access to in the States. Yeah. Um, now, I think that also we start to consider the two products the same, the, the idebinone that you can get from Kirkland or one of those other manufacturers. Um, but there, someone's just wondering if there's, you know, a way mm -hmm. to get access to it before before um, you know, the Citeros trial is complete and approval for pulled so, pull these back. So, I mean, uh, there's a couple of, let's say, legal uh, language I would yeah. like to start with uh, first. Um, Idebinone is uh, an investigational drug and needs to be approved by the FDA. I am well aware that there are certain vendors are selling forms of Idebinone uh, in the U.S. and also in Europe which is essentially illegal. And the FDA has clearly demanded already many years ago that adebinone for, for its use, safe use in, in humans need to be approved by the FDA. That's why we're doing all this clinical trial work, not only efficacy but also other work that needs to be done. So, um, so I cannot obviously comment on, on, the, on the strategy of these other vendors to try to bring it to the market. However, we, we know from the FDA that there have been actions against such vendors by the FDA because they are saying that's an unregulated uh, source that is uh, violating the rules that FDA has set. So uh, having said this, um, we do have an expanded access program ongoing okay. in the United States where uh, patients who are not eligible to be enrolled in the CIDRO study may be eligible for the expanded access program. We understand there are patients falling out of the inclusion criteria of the CIDRO study uh, and we wanted to find a vehicle that patients could then get access to uh, uh, idebinone, the pharmaceutical grade that we are uh, providing under an, a formal expanded access program that has been approved by the FDA. And the criteria for enrollment are available, uh, can be, can be uh, asked either our contact uh, sites or uh, we, can, we can provide this information. PPMD also has information about that. Mm. Is, is it available on your website, or you suggest they go to their clinician or our site? There is a, there's a, there is a website available yeah, for it. And uh, we, if, if you have requests, then we can funnel it to uh, Jody, and she will provide you with the uh, information. Jody is our patient advocacy representative and head in, in the United States. Um, so we are precluded to advertise the expanded access program, but you can get information. and We will assist you. And if you, Abby, get requests from uh, families, please forward to Jody, and then we can disseminate the appropriate okay. information. Okay. And I, you know, I just just from my own lens, thinking about sort of uh, you know the work that you're doing and um, sort of other products that are available from various manufacturers. I mean, the advantage to the work you're doing is we know the safety profile, we know the manufacturer, and we know the product is going to be consistent. So um, I just really, we really appreciate the good work that uh, that you're doing. So um, I don't have, I don't see any other questions. I don't know if you want to make any final comments or have any last thoughts. Thomas and Christina. Uh, no, we are fine. So I just wanted to reiterate our, uh, let's say, main message of today is if, if families or uh, patients are considering to enrolling in the CIDRO study, I think now is the time to come forward. We would like to wrap up the study soon. Uh, we have also asked our study sites, both in the U.S. and Europe, to make a final effort to find essentially one patient per site would easily do it. Uh, so I think um, if families are considering and are considering enrolling into CIDROS, maybe that's the time now to come yeah. forward and, and call the uh, physicians next door, uh, or at least in the 
in the in the state that you are and you find the information contact information on, on the sidrosdmd.com website or via PPMD uh, we can also um, help with information uh, from our medical team. Okay. And one last question just came in and it's about inclusion criteria and I um it's asking if um you know, if there's any inclusion related to mutation status, and I believe you said that it doesn't matter if you have a duplication yes. or a deletion or anything. It's just all yes. mutation types. Okay. Yes, exactly. Just wanted yeah, to re no reiterate mutation. that. Yeah. I just yeah. I just see it here now. The question was whether this is a, a preference for duplications versus deletions. The answer is it doesn't matter. Any doesn't matter. any mutation type is eligible. Mm. Correct. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, um, thank you very much, Thomas and Christina. This is really, really informative, and we thank you for all the work you're doing, and Jody too, um, and we know we'll be in touch. And if we get any other questions, we will forward them on to you, and then we can post the questions with the answers uh, when we post the, um, the webinar itself on our site. So, so thank you, everybody, for listening, and have a great rest of your afternoon. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very you. much.